makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Kriti Gupta in London with the conversations that matter. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Taiwan hit by the worst earthquake in 25 years, killing at least four people and disrupting some chip production lines. Meanwhile, she and Biden talk but say very little on the imminent U.S. tariff review. The focus now turning to Janet Yellen's trip to China on Friday with a tougher line from the Treasury Secretary now anticipated. And European stocks mixed on speculation that rates are going to stay higher for longer. Euro, Euro area inflation data due today about 10 a.m., another step closer potentially to the ECB's 2% target. Now let's take a quick look at the European markets map. Look, we are seeing a little bit of a mixed picture. Risk sentiment souring just a little bit. You are seeing, excuse me, some underperformance on the FTSE 100, down six tenths of 1%. Look, it's been a marathon day already this morning. When we're talking about some of the headlines here, the underperformance of the UK might simply be a little bit of a pullback that you are seeing specifically from that record high we saw on the FTSE 100. But again, some micro stories that we're going to be watching there as well. Limited movement in the rest of the continent, though. When you look at the DAX, when you look at the CAC as well, those kind of indexes on the continent, not seeing that much. How much of that is waiting for the inflationary data that we're going to get? In the meantime, I want to get a quick check on futures as well and where we are actually over in the U.S. session because, remember, that time change has kicked in now. So we are seeing some of the risk sentiment from Europe from Asia kind of slide in here. Now remember the ramifications out of the TSMC story out of the earthquake in Taiwan still yet to be digested by the U.S. markets. Plus you've got Intel down pre-market. We're going to dive into some of the tech stories in the United States that may be driving the underperformance you are seeing in the Nasdaq 100. In the meantime, let's go cross asset here because like I said, the euro area inflation is due out shortly at about 10 a.m. U.K. time. How much of that moves the market in the 10-year yield? You are seeing 438 on that benchmark for the 10-year this is important because, look, it's coming off those comments that we got from the Fed's semester and the Fed's daily basically saying three rate cuts are still priced in this market or at least expected to be by the end of the year. Is the Federal Reserve, however, running out of time? That's going to be a story that we watch. In addition to some of the geopolitics around the world, remember, you are seeing Brent crude get closer and closer to that $90 a barrel level, 88.98 is where we are on that commodity. In the meantime, let's get to one of our top stories here. Taiwan's fire agency reported as saying four people have been killed in the strongest quake to hit the island in a quarter of a century. Bring us now Robert Lee from Bloomberg Intelligence. Robert, a pleasure to have you on the program. Bring us up to date with the developments on the ground. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Um, as you said in your intro, this is uh, one of the largest earthquakes that's hit Taiwan in recent history. Um, having said that, just to give you a very brief uh, geography lesson on the island of Taiwan, Taiwan is a very densely populated uh, island, although the majority of the population lives on the periphery and mainly on the west coast. This earthquake hit on the east coast in a place called Hualien, which is a very beautifully, uh, a very beautiful uh, but less populated uh, and more rural area of the island. So in geographical terms, Hualien, or where the epicenter of the earthquake was, was just under 200 kilometers from Taipei, which is the capital of Taiwan. And therefore, the major damage seems to have been concentrated on the eastern side of the island, not in the capital. And also the major industrial and science parks within the, company, uh, within the, uh, within the uh, island, I should say, uh, where the likes of TSMC and its peers are located. Again, they're on that more densely populated west coast. Um, there are well-developed protocols and procedures in place uh, that are put in place to protect human life, first and foremost, but also pro to protect the buildings and assets. So they seem to have worked like clockwork. The buildings were evacuated. Production was shut down. So I think the conclusion to all of that is whilst there may be some production lasting a, a number of days, at this point, it looks like the, the, the impact on the Taiwan food chain and, and wider global food chain is likely to be fairly limited based on where we are today on what we know so far. You're talking about not having as much of a global ramification as some of the damage is still being expected uh, or at least assessed. Is there a more shorter term ramification, though, when you look at TSMC in particular? Again, based on limited information at the moment, I mean, these fabs of TSMC are built to be as earthquake-proof as possible. So, um, so the buildings and the design of them themselves in sort of rubber buffers and other things that protect the equipment and protect the individuals that work within them. 
So uh, I think if we were talking about a scenario where the epicenter was very close to one of these facilities, clearly the potential damage could be larger. But based on what we know so far, production was shut down, the procedures worked uh, as they were supposed to, uh, and whilst TSMC hasn't given a formal update, um, I think looking at the facts and, and taking a logical conclusion, the impact on their production is likely to be relatively minimal. Um, and again, don't forget that Taiwan is an island that sits within, sits within the ring of fire. And whilst today's earthquake was large enough with what they would normally expect, you know, earthquakes are of a fre frequent uh, occurrence in Taiwan. So this is nothing substantially new, uh, but obviously of larger magnitude than what we've seen in recent years. It's interesting because it's coming, of course, at a time that we're talking as well about potentially U.S. production and U.S. kind of domesticity around uh, the supply chain as well. We still have a little bit of the market reaction pointing to that risk sentiment. Robert, there's a lot going on in the chip space. The read through from the TSMC story, which, by the way, is closing down in the market by about 1.3 percent, I believe, in the Asian session. Is there a more market read through? Why are markets in particular spooked if, as you point out, the implications may not be as severe? Yeah, I mean, TSMC has traded off, but as you said, I mean, we're in the low single-digit range. And I think if, uh, if we were seeing larger share price declines, you know, 5%, 10% would probably be indicative of wider concern on both their business. Um, so we're not seeing that. I'd also say, just looking at technicals for a moment, you know, TSMC's uh, share price has is, is, is been hitting a key technical level recently, which has been struggling to, to break through. Um, so you need to sort of see it in that context as well. Um, but again, on fundamentals... I would say, based on everything we know at the moment, then there is unlikely to be a long-lasting impact on TSMC's production, uh, both neither impacting their business and probably the read across to the wider tech food chain, and the likes of NVIDIA, et cetera, again, are likely to be more minimal based on the information we see at the moment. All right, Robert Lee from Bloomberg Intelligence, breaking down the impacts of that Taiwan earthquake and what it means for the global supply chain. We thank you so much. In the meantime, we are getting a redhead crossing the Bloomberg terminal. China relaxing the loan ratio for vehicle purchases. Remember, this comes in the context as well as when we've seen a lot of the EV deliveries and that kind of a leader of electrification, perhaps dissip dissipating just a little bit. For now, we are getting that headline about the loan ratio. We will get more headlines to you as we get more information. In the meantime, I want to go to the geopolitics here. President Biden and his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, have spoken by phone in their first one-on-one -on -one communication since November. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg senior reporter on China's economy and government, James Mager. James, a pleasure to have you on the program. It felt like the readouts didn't yield a lot, but I'm curious what stood out to you. I think the thing that stood out most was the, this seemed more cordial than you know, the previous statements we've seen from these kind of discussions. I mean, obviously, these readouts are from both sides very much emphasizing what they wanted to talk about and what, you know, what they thought was the most important thing. But it's, especially the Chinese uh, readout, there was uh, less of the complaining uh, and, and the sort of pointed, uh, you know, pointed complaints that you've seen about American actions than I think there's been previously. And there was a lot more emphasis on you know, how the two sides could cooperate and how this was important, that there had been building stability and they should continue to build stability. And so I think from, you know, from what we can tell from, these, from the readouts that we see, it, it did seem like the, the conversation was more cordial than, than, it, than things have been, you know, say, this time last year when relations were incredibly tense. Uh, obviously, there are still many, many issues within, in, the, in the relationship. Uh, and you saw that in the Chinese statement where they were very, you know, very vociferous in complaining about U.S. technology sanctions and how they see that as trying to you know, stop, the, stop the development of China. Um, but, and you know, obviously, the U.S. readout you know, mentions fentanyl, which is a, this is a big issue where the U.S. wants China to do a lot more to try and stop the flow of precursor chemicals to Mexico and other places which they blame for the fentanyl crisis in the U.S. But, I mean, overall, I think that, as I said, the, the, the thing that jumped out for, was the fact that it seemed less aggressive or less carping and complaining than we've seen in the past. How much of a precedent does this set, then, for Janet Yellen and her visit to China this week. There's a lot of concern about devaluation in the yuan. What does that mean for not only the export story, but also for treasury inflows? Walk us through the significance, or lack thereof, of Janet Yellen's visit. I think the Treasury Secretary's got a lot of things she, needs to, she wants to speak about while she was here. There's you know, dozens of points that we hear on the list of things that have to be discussed. Um, 
you know, one of those is obviously, as you said, the yen, the, sorry, the yuan is, is weakening uh, and there is a lot of pressure on it to weaken further. Uh, and it's sort of bumping up against the, 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 the bottom end of the band that the, that the central bank has set. And um, with, especially if the Fed keeps rates higher for longer, that's going to only increase the pressure on the, you know, the one to weaken because the, the, the PBOC is going the other way and they're trying to cut interest rates or trying to increase monetary easing to support the economy. So that's going to increase pressure on the currency, which is not what you know, other countries want to see. They don't want to see China, in a sense, devaluing the currency or allowing the country to devalue because that would boost exports. And that leads into the other, one of the other big problems that Jenny Yellen wants to talk about, which is here, which is what the U.S. sees as the issue of Chinese overcapacity. There's a lot of different ways you can look at what is you know, Chinese overcapacity or Chinese industrial capacity. And I think some of the complaints from the U.S. and the EU are overstated. You know, there's lots of overcapacity in the, in, the, in the market here, but a lot of that is on stuff that isn't traded, you know, isn't exported, like cement, uh, rebar, because of the housing market crisis. And that's not really a decision by China to have a housing market crisis to that extent. So there is a lot of things that they want to talk about, but I think it's a good sign that the discussions we saw overnight is a good sign leading into that, the meeting, the, the, the Janet Yellen's visit later this week. All right, Bloomberg's James Mager joining us from Beijing to talk to us a little bit about that U.S.-China relationship. We thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. In the meantime, I want to bring up one of the major stocks that we are watching in the pre-market. This, of course, having implications for the technology story around the world. Intel down about 4% in the pre-market after saying that losses have deepened at the chip makers factory network and the business may not even reach a break-even point for several years. Remember, this is coming amid a very big kind of cost-cutting mission from Pat Gelsinger, a turnaround story for Intel, which doesn't seem to be going their way. Those worries and that pressure and that announcement pushing the shares down about 4% this morning. Coming up on the program, we go from the stock market to the bond market. Hopes of quick rate cuts from the Federal Reserve fading after pretty some strong data on the U.S. economy, plus some Fed speak. Mary Daly saying she still believes there will be three reductions this year alongside Loretta Mester. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. The most likely scenario is that inflation will continue on a downward trajectory to 2% over time, but I need to see more data to raise my confidence. Some further monthly readings will give us a better sense of whether the disinflation process is stalling out or whether the start of the year readings reflect a temporary detour on the downward path back to price stability. The labor market is still going strong and growth is going strong. So there's really no urgency to adjust the rate. We need to be sufficiently confident that we're on the right path of rebalancing the economy and it bringing inflation down to 2%. Commentary there from Fed officials Loretta Mester and Mary Daly giving their view on rate cuts. The consensus, at least between those two, seems to be three rate cuts by the end of the year. But what is the read through? Globally, is there even one? Let's bring in a true expert, Elise Bedois, managing director and head of EMEA Research over at Citigroup Global Markets, joins me this morning. Talk to us a little bit about what we're watching from a macro perspective at a time when the discussion seems to be around a potential divergence between the Fed and the ECB. Connect the dots for us here. Right. So we're just coming out of uh, a lot of bottom up data during the, you know, the uh, result season, uh, uh, full year result season globally. Uh, and obviously now refocusing completely on the macro data. Um, clearly, uh, inflation has been sticky around the world. Uh, we've seen inflation coming down for, um, you know, for goods, for consumer goods, for core inflation. But unfortunately, uh, you know, services is still quite, um, you know, we're still seeing sticky inflation there. That's basically what markets, I think, have been really focused on. Certainly, that's, invest that's the investor feedback we have. Uh, but going forward, um, the key question is obviously around cuts. We at City are still forecasting uh, a series of cuts starting from June in all major developed markets, so um, Bank of England, um, ECB and the Fed. When we talk about the ECB and these rate cuts that a lot of people are saying seems to be potentially front-running the Federal Reserve when we talk about weakness here in Europe, is that a tailwind for European equities or does the growth picture overshadow the equity story here? I, 
I think, you know, with, with equities, obviously, we're forecasting um, uh, very mild gains uh, in Europe, probably high single digit gains to the year end. Um, but we've recently upgraded our EPS forecast from 3% to 6% for this year. Yeah. And that's really trickling through uh, some mild GDP growth, uh, some mild GDP improvements that our economists are seeing. Where we have perhaps some lightness in the economy, obviously, PMIs have not necessarily they're, they're bottoming but they, they haven't precisely ticked up um, so I think that's what we're watching in terms of uh, going, going forward talk to us about the EPS story though it's mm -hmm. interesting that you peg that to growth as opposed to growth or consumer resilience in the United States where it feels like that has been feeding a lot of the outperformance for certain companies in terms of revenue here how much of the exposure to the United States is one a tailwind or two a risk if we see a slowdown there i i think you know what's key uh you know i'm going to talk here about european equities specifically uh, is obviously uh, you know europe is, is exposed to is a very international uh, style market so uh, let's not make the mistake of assuming it's a proxy for european economies and right. especially for the uk i mean this is really true the uk is a hugely international market um, so obviously, um, growth has to come from internationally, and I think you haven't mentioned China, but China is huge in this picture. So actually, less than the U.S., I would look at China for a source of growth, and any uh, positive news from China, any sort of, I, I wouldn't say necessarily positive, but you know, certainly uh, easing news from China is very important for European equities, and I think that's a key driver. It's interesting that you talked about talk about China, and yet you're still doubling your, your EPS at least for the Correct. year given that China's still in an economic slowdown, one I would argue that's more severe than any other country, or at least in, in the ones that we watch in terms mm -hmm. of the Western economies in the entire world. So, so why the divergence there? If EPS is expected to double, in your view, how, does the Chinese consumer play more into it, or is it more of an export story? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's exactly doubling. I mean, you know, we're going from 3% uh, forecast up earlier this year. The market was pricing probably 5% down. It's corrected. Yeah. Uh, we got to that point. We've had uh, a lot of interesting information at full year results, and we're moving up to 6%. It's still, you know, mid-single digit. It's still very subdued. And um, in our targets, when we expect the market up mid-single digit, we do not expect, uh, um, you know, re a re-rating. It's, it's purely, you know, the, uh, the same multiple applied, which is, you know, 12, 13 times, really, applied to the same uh, EPS growth. So I think where the, where the growth um, is coming from. First of all, resilience in margin. I think we've seen incredible resilience in margin. We're very surprised. I guess the market was certainly surprised by that. Um, and, and sources of growth quite well diversified, frankly, in Europe and, and some fairly um, unique sectors, uh, you know, like luxury goods um, are doing very well. Yeah. Is So, okay, so we've got the China story. We talked yes. a little bit about the United States. I want to zero into the commodity story and the FX story. What drives or what Effects, I think is a better way to put it, the European equity story at the moment. When we're looking at oil, just shy of $90 a barrel, when we're looking at almost continued weakness in the euro, in euro dollar, positioning that suggests more euro weakness to come, put that together for us, the FX and the commodity read through into the equity market. Sure. So commodity is very important. I mean, obviously, all eyes are on the oil price. Uh, I heard earlier uh, on the show this morning talks about the oil price at 100 uh, obviously, what's key for the equity market, the read through, is whether the oil price coming up is an external shock or whether it's a consequence of an economy faring somewhat better. So whether it's demand led or whether it's, for example, um, a deterioration, which we haven't seen, of geopolitical conditions. Clearly, um, the mechanism of transmission to the economy of a higher, uh, of, of an external geopolitical shock, for example, the crisis in the Middle East, is the oil price. When the market sees that, when they see that mechanism of transmission through the oil price, it's a negative sign and it leads to longer inflation and problems. When we have an oil price that's, so to speak, healthy because the economy is faring better, yeah. it's always, always a good sign for the European economy, particularly the UK economy, which is almost a proxy for oil. Yeah, uh, so much more to digest there. Sadly, we're out of time. We thank you so much for joining the program. Elise Badawa there from Citigroup Global Markets joining us this morning. Coming up on the program, we're going to dive into a little bit more about what Elise was just saying there. Inflation in the euro area expected to drop further. We're going to discuss what this means for the ECB as the pressure grows to cut rates. This is Bloomberg.
Euro area inflation for March due in about 30 minutes time. I want to get more of Bloomberg's Yana Randa. Yana, walk us through what we're expecting. How's this changed the game for the ECB? So what we are expecting is another slowdown to 2.5 percent um, for the eurozone as a whole. Um, so definitely a move in the right direction. Um, that will obviously, um, you know, um, uh, be a welcome uh, piece of information for policymakers from across the region. Uh, will it be enough um, for for the ECB to maybe decide already um, next week to cut interest rates? Probably not. Um, the uh, policymakers yeah. have said that they need more information. They want uh, they want more, um, you know, uh -huh. more data on the economy, on wages. So, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we'll have to sit tight. Yana Rando, thank you so much. This is Bloomberg. Taiwan hit by its worst earthquake in 25 years, killing at least four people, intercepting some chip production lines. She and Biden talk, but say little on the imminent U.S. tariff review. The focus now turning to Janet Yellen's trip to China on Friday, with a tougher line from the Treasury Secretary now anticipated. And European stocks mixed on speculation that rates will be higher for longer. But euro area inflation data due today could be taking another step closer to the ECB's 2% target. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Kriti Gupta in London. Look, there's a lot to digest from the geopolitics to the economic data. But first, we want to start with the currency story. The yuan, the Chinese yuan, weakening to its weakest levels that it's allowed to trade at against the dollar. Remember, there's that 2% daily trading range. And you are seeing a little bit of a reaction in the uh, yuan as well uh, against the dollar, against the yuan, the offshore renminbi, I should say, 726 at the moment. You are seeing a little bit of a bump on that as we talk about that approach closer to it. It's coming off concerns around export data, concerns about the Chinese economy. What does some sort of move to stabilize the currency do for currencies around the world and the treasury inflow story? That's just one part of the geopolitics. Let's get to another and go to the commodity story. Oil up more than one and a half percent over the past three days. It comes as an industry report points to a drawdown in U.S. crude inventories. It also comes ahead of an OPEC plus meeting expected to affirm current supply cuts. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Anthony DePaolo. Anthony, a pleasure to have you on the program. A lot of volatility with oil. Just an hour ago, we were talking about whether $90 a barrel, potentially 100 were on the docket. Now we're seeing oil in negative territory. Walk us through what's moving it. Yeah, I mean, slightly down uh, a little bit right now, but in general, keeping uh, some of those gains from the first quarter. So oil did uh, did a pretty good, uh, had a pretty good performance in the first quarter in terms of in terms of rising, and we've we've kept those levels. So we're we're, we're closer to 90 uh, really these days than we have been for the for the whole year, uh, and that's on the back of a lot of the uh, geopolitical pressures that built uh, throughout the first part of this year. Uh, in terms of the uh, is Israel uh, war in Gaza and a lot of the attacks on tankers there. Uh, those perhaps haven't moved oil as much as people would have thought initially because we haven't seen oil tankers and oil supplies actually affected. But there is a longer route that's affecting uh, freight rates, that's affecting insurance. And so that is having an impact on the market. There is a little bit of risk in there. And now we're seeing, as you said, those higher inventories, excuse me, those, those inventory draws, rather, uh, from the United States, which is a, a very important market where traders watch those commercial stocks to see what's happening. And OPEC Plus is continuing its cuts, trying to draw some of that oil out of storage and stop a buildup of, of stockpiles uh, in the, the market, uh, Kriti. We're talking about this kind of tailwinds for the oil story. Inventory drawdowns, yes, but it feels like the over the overarching theme has been supply from the United States, supply from some of these other producers as you laid out. Could $100 a barrel come in the next couple of months? What's the outlook? Yeah, well, this is what OPEC Plus has really got to balance, and, and that's why we're seeing those cuts, uh, is that they are trying to compensate for those other barrels coming online uh, in the United States, in Brazil and Guyana. Uh, a lot of those barrels coming on are expected to, to make up uh, for a lot of the demand uh, that we're seeing added to the market. So it's a, a roughly balanced 
picture depending on how you see it. Now, the question is, w will we see those demand signals come in more strongly? Uh, will that Chinese recovery finally uh, kick in fully? We're, we're seeing signs that it's, it's picking up a little bit, but it was slower uh, than OPEC Plus hoped coming out of COVID. So we'll see how that uh, plays into the rest of the year. But OPEC Plus is, is staying the course uh, for now. Uh, those cuts are in place at least through the end of the first half, potentially longer. And so we'll, we'll see how that develops, how they see uh, the market and that other supply coming in, whether they need to keep those barrels off the market. Of course, when they do start bringing those barrels on, more likely towards the end of the year, that is going to have that, that downward impact on prices. But we are hearing discussion uh, about as the market tightens towards the end of the year, seeing those higher prices, 90s, 100s, uh, we're, we're talking about those levels again, Kriti. All right, Bloomberg's Anthony DePaolo walking us through that bull case for the oil story. We thank you so much for walking us through it. In the meantime, given all those kind of supply and demand dynamics, you also have the geopolitics to factor in as well. President Joe Biden now saying that Israel has not done enough to protect civilians after the death of seven aid workers, marking some of his strongest criticism yet in terms of the Middle East. This comes as Iran vows revenge on Israel after blaming it for a deadly airstrike on its embassy in Syria. Joining me now, Fawaz Jerjez, chair and professor of the contemporary Middle East at the London School of Economics. Fawaz, a pleasure to have you on the program. This criticism that we're getting from Thank President you. Biden, being very outspoken, following some of the criticism he's getting and pressure he's facing domestically, from your perspective, does it change how things may play out on the ground? Uh, I fear not. Uh, I mean, I think there is a big disconnect between words um, and rhetoric coming from the White House and actions. Uh, you mentioned that the president said that Israel has not done enough to protect civilians. Uh, we're talking about almost 33,000 Palestinians who have been killed, uh, 74,000 who have been injured, uh, aid workers, uh, almost 200 aid workers have been killed in the past six months. Uh, nurses, doctors, uh, you know, uh, storehouses. Um, I think without leverage, the president of the United States so far, despite the spat of word with the Israeli prime minister, he has not used any leverage to really pressure Israel, not only to minimize uh, civilian uh, death, but also uh, to uh, accept uh, a ceasefire, a permanent ceasefire. As you know, uh, the uh, Security Council basically passed a resolution calling on Israel and Hamas to have an immediate ceasefire. Yet what we are seeing in the past few days, sadly, is that Israel has been escalating in Gaza, uh, in Syria, um, uh, on the northern border uh, in Iran and the West Bank. Uh, the occupied West Bank. So the situation without leverage, without the Biden administration taking actions, final word, I'm sorry I have spoken too long, um, even though the president says that Israel has not done enough to protect civilian lives, the Biden administration now is in the process of sending one of the largest military packages to Israel, 18 uh, billion U.S. dollars in arms to Israel in the next few days when it passes the Congress. A weapons review that was in place for years, uh, or I think in, in scheduling, I should say, for months to come. Fawaz, talk to us about the leverage from the regional players, from the Middle East in particular, the UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, among others. What does the regional focus look like? Why is there not more pressure there? Well, look, uh, really, I, I just want to tell you, viewers, I'm not talking politics here. Uh, the United States, the Biden administration, has humiliated its regional partners, uh, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar. They have been begging the administration to accept a ceasefire, a humanitarian ceasefire. Think about it. How many times the Arab foreign ministers, the Arab president, a Sisi of Egypt, Mohammed bin Salman, um, in Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Zayed in the United Arab Emirates, that the United States, the Biden administration, has consistently opposed a, an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. And when it abstained in the Security Council, a Security Council passed unanimously, 14 members passed, I mean, voted for a unanimous ceasefire. What did the administration do? What did the Biden administration say after the passing 
U.S. Security Council, he said that it's not basically Israel does not really have to abide by the resolution. He said it's not really, um, a, you know, uh, 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 I mean, uh, obligatory on the part of Israel, and it will have no impact on Israel's policy. If I were Benjamin Netanyahu, I'm talking from realism, the school of realism in international relations. If I were Benjamin Netanyahu, yeah. the prime minister of Israel, why would I stop the war if I have American arms, American political support, uh, no, no pressure on me? Benjamin Netanyahu cares for one audience, one single audience, that is President Biden and the Biden administration, because the entire world, the entire world community, including the United Kingdom, where you are, you and I are, basically voted for an immediate uh, ceasefire. Let's talk about the foreign policy argument in favor of the way the Biden administration is acting. And, and, and the reason I bring this up is just to kind of understand the counterpoints here. One of the arguments to continue that support with Israel, the historic support, has been to offset the pressures from Iran in particular, even just in terms of the latest headlines with Israel's attack on the Iranian embassy in Syria. There is a lot of question of what that counterattack, that reciprocity might look like from Iran. But was walk us through it here. After years of sanctions, years of, econo years of economic turmoil, a Red Sea situation that's not getting better anytime soon, what is Iran's response? Well, I think it, the simple answer is that we don't know, right? We, we are speculating, you and I and all of us. But I think if you ask me about Iranian strategy, Iranian strategy is that does not really want a direct war with either the United States or with Israel. Iran has repeatedly said so. The Americans have made it very clear that Iran does not really want war. What we are seeing now is that really, again, no politics. Israel is pushing Iran to the limits. Israel is trying to show that Iran is a paper tiger. It's trying to degrade Iranians' deterrence. It has repeatedly attacked Iranian targets, not just in Syria, but also inside Iran, as you know scientists, diplomats, commanders, is pushing really Iran. My take on it is that the Iran's National Security Council yesterday has made a decision to retaliate. Make no doubts about it. It will retaliate because the attack in Syria on Friday was really a game changer. It attacked Israel the first time, attacked really Iranian sovereignty and Iranian consulate. It killed seven senior officers, including three top uh, Al-Quds revolutionary forces uh, generals. But my take on it, again, I could be wrong. Iran will retaliate, but a limited response. Iran does not really want to provoke all-out war with Israel, even though Israel really is pushing the envelope on the northern front in Iran, because Iran fears that uh, Israel is trying to drag it into all-out conflict with the United States, because if war were or was to break out between Israel and Iran, the Iranians fear that the Americans will come in to protect their most important ally in the region, Israel. A lot of complexities in the region, a lot of complexities in the foreign policy of, of multiple Western countries and how they're reacting to what's going on to the humanitarian toll on the ground. Fawaz Georges, we have to leave it there, but we thank you so much for your analysis. Joining us from the London School of Economics. Coming up on the program, we go from geopolitics to the earnings story. Companies to watch in the second quarter. Bloomberg Intelligence gives us their top 10 picks and the reasons behind it. That conversation next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Intelligence has identified 10 companies to watch in 2024 second quarter across sectors and regions, all part of a larger group of high confidence focus ideas that BI analysts flag on an ongoing basis. Let's dive into the details. Bloomberg Intelligence Director of Research and European Strategist Tim Craighead joins us this morning. Before we dive into the specific companies, talk to us about methodology here. Yep. So these 10 are part of a broader list of what we call focus ideas, as you've referred to. Uh, these have three pillars that they stand on. One, there's a high conviction fundamental view that the analyst has. Number two, uh, it's different from what the market appears to be discounting in some way or another. Quite often we compare these to consensus estimates. 
Um, and number three, most importantly, there are catalysts ahead that can bring the market around if we happen to be right. Um, you can find all these uh, on BI space focus on the terminal. Uh, there you go. Um, these 10 specifically have catalysts coming up in the second quarter, and that's why we've zeroed in for these 10. Talk to us then about the company specifically. They're not all European-based. Yep. Walk us through the logic there. So there are three that are European, uh, and they span certainly sectors. One is Accor, one is Standard Chartered, one is Pirelli. That gives you a sense of the diversity. Yeah. Um, Accor, travel recovery, big story. We think it's got more legs than what consensus right now thinks. It, you know, if you go to, to travel and you're booking a hotel, it's kind of shocking how expensive hotels are. That's feeding right through to Accor's margins. And you got the Semper Olympics coming up, which is yeah. one of those catalysts for these guys. Pirelli, tire company, it's shifting its production to lower cost places like Romania and Mexico, and it's up, um, uh, upgrading its mix to higher and higher end products. Uh, again, driving better, we think, uh, earnings. Standard Charter, we think, is provisioned against its China property woes. Uh, and the growth in asset management, uh, wealth management for them in Asia is quite dramatic and we think is underappreciated. So that gives you a flavor for three that happen to be in Europe. Yeah, um, interesting dynamics because they're all different fundamental stories, regional diversity there as well. Former Intelligence Director of Research and European Strategist Tim Craighead joining us this morning. Of course, you can find more of that analysis on BI Focus. Now, plenty of more analysis as well from Bloomberg Economics. Donald Trump's tariff plan likely to send inflation above the Fed's target, adding that pressure to raise interest rates. It gets kind of wonky, but Bloomberg Economics crunched the numbers. We're bringing in the senior global economist there, Mava Cousins, joining us this morning. Mava, a pleasure to have you on the program. The numbers here were fascinating in terms of the impact they might have on the American economy, specifically when we think of, or at least have been advertised, that tariffs are going to have a short-term impact on the American economy. Your numbers suggesting otherwise. Walk us through it. So yes, thanks, thanks a lot for having me. So we've looked at different proposal, tariff proposals that have been floated by uh, candidate Donald Trump on the campaign trail. In particular, 60% tariffs on all goods imports from China and an additional 10% tariffs on all goods imports from uh, all other countries. And of course, this second scenario would be the one with the most severe impact. And what we've done is that we've looked at the long-term implications, but also the dynamics of the adjustment. And what we find in this analysis is that after two years of these 60% tariffs on China and 10% tariffs um, on um, the rest of the world, assuming that they are implemented from the start of 2025 when the new administration comes into office, what we find is that after two years, GDP could be 0.5% lower and prices could be 2.5% higher than they would have been without the tariffs. And for inflation, it means that inflation, instead of returning to 2, 2.1%, as most uh, economists currently expect, uh, inflation could return to about 3.7% by the end of 2025, so well ahead of the um, uh, Federal Reserve's 2% target. It's interesting that we talk about this kind of deceleration and, and, and contraction, really, in the GDP growth that's modeled, because my understanding is it's not just the 60 percent tariffs in China as well. It's also 10 percent on tariff from the rest of the world. You have to have both to actually have that kind of contraction. But in terms of one or the other, given that some of the foreign policies, some of the tariffs around the likes of Mexico, for example, or the EU haven't been outlined from the Trump administration, could that then turn these numbers more positive? Um, it's not. In our estimate, it doesn't turn into positive. We also assume, by the way, that these 60% tariffs on China gets uh, reciprocated reciproc reciproc from China, so that there is 60% uh, tariffs from China on the U.S. So it doesn't turn into positive, but the impact, and especially the impact on prices, is more moderate, mostly because basically uh, you can have a much more um, smoother adjustment by turning to other uh, importers in other countries, other partners, including to some extent possibly some transshipment where some of the goods are shipped from China, maybe transformed slightly in another country and then sent back to the US, uh, which really has uh, his, his impact, smooths its impact.
that reciprocity, of course, very much in focus of what that looks like in terms of the European, the Chinese, the Mexican, among other countries' response. Bloomberg Senior Global Economist, Maeva Cousins, we thank you so much for walking us through that crucial analysis. Coming up on the program, more geopolitics at hand. Bloomberg learns that NATO is proposing a $100 billion fund to aid Ukraine as foreign ministers meet to mark the alliance's 75th anniversary. Details ahead. This is Bloomberg. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg proposing to establish a fund of contributions worth $100 billion over five years for Ukraine. It comes as foreign ministers from the alliance gather in Brussels to mark the group's 75th anniversary. I want to get a little bit more here from Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Roz Matheson, who, of course, is watching the geopolitics very, very closely. Roz, walk us through this proposal. Well, as you say, it would be a $100 billion fund over five years. And the idea behind that is to really lock in this military aid for Ukraine for a protracted period to get all the member states to contribute financially to that, to centralise some of these movement of weapons and purchases and movements into Ukraine. It would also include bringing into the NATO tent more directly the kind of logistical responsibility for these weapons deliveries into Ukraine. Right now, that's a US-led effort, obviously in conjunction with Ukraine. But the concern with all of this is that if this war in Ukraine goes on, Russia is showing no signs of backing down there in its fight. Uh, is there a point where it becomes even harder to get military aid to Ukraine, given the, the political climate in the US, given general sense of fatigue? And obviously, this is about, in a way, future-proofing some of that aid to Ukraine, particularly, again, with the US election coming up, the prospect of Donald Trump returning to the White House. He's made very clear he doesn't think the US should be supplying Ukraine with aid at all. He's also made many pot shots over the years at NATO, you know, questioning that why NATO exists, what it actually achieves, and whether the US should continue to give it money. So there's lots of questions there about what aid to Ukraine might look like down the track, uh, regardless also of whether it's Donald Trump in the White House, because even if Joe Biden is re-elected in the US, it doesn't seem to be a strong sense of support politically at the moment uh, across the aisle politically in the U.S. to keep that aid going. So this is all about finding ways to try and lock in some of that aid to future-proof it a little bit, at least for Ukraine, because the sense is obviously Ukraine is running very, very short on weapons, even in the immediate term. Bloomberg's Amir News Director Roz Matheson walking us through that crucial NATO story. And look, it's not just the only thing we're watching because there is the inflationary pressure. There's the fiscal pressure as well, not to mention the OPEC story. Plenty of Fed speak. But what's got our eye in the next five minutes is in euro area inflation data. Those CPI numbers coming in in just a few minutes, 10 a.m. UK time. You don't want to miss it. We'll have full coverage right here on Bloomberg TV.